the video on Nathan and the church, the ultimate imagery of an accountability partner. You know, uh, it is uh, very common in and around ministry and in and around churches that we talk about having an accountability partner, the kind of person that is, we can go to, that we can talk to in leadership, when we're in leadership, and uh, be able to have some sense of accountability. It's almost as if we're looking into a mirror, and that person in that mirror is not our imagery, but the imagery of someone else who is going to provide the kind of insight and even confrontation that we need. Uh, the prophets of old, they perhaps were the model, as it were, of an accountability partner. Uh, what were the things about the prophets, you know, when you look at them? Well, most often, first off, they've got to be a person who is in relationship, deep, abiding, day by day, talk with God, relationship with him. And so that's the first thing about accountability partner. It's got to be a person who clearly is with the Lord. But you'll also find about them that they're not, they not, they're not a part of, they're not, they're not, quote, they're typically... Don't, they typically don't have a responsibility like a priest, where a priest is just constantly in a setting where they are, you know, uh, providing sacrifices and constantly in contact with the people. They're not absorbed into the people like that. There's a great thing that was said about Jesus. Of course, Jesus is the ultimate prophet, priest, king, and more than that. But there was something that Jesus said, you know, and, and it, is, it is these words. They would not give himself to man because he knew what was in man. And there is that sense of a person who's going to be a prophet, an accountability partner, a person who is a person of God, a person who has concern, deep concern for people, and a person who has love, but he's not compromised by relationship with people and certainly with the person who uh, he is holding or she is holding accountable. Uh, but anyway, let's go take a look at one of the prophets we're going to draw up on. And that is Nathan. And that Nathan um, was involved in telling David the commands of the Lord. Now, we don't see him actually appear until like 2 Samuel chapter 7. But it is clear in the life of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, oh, it's in the book of, uh, of Chronicles, in his life, he even mentions that he wants to follow the commands of God that were given to David, his forefather, by the seer Gad and by Nathan. So we know that David had this ongoing relationship with Nathan. Now, we've already told you in terms of accountability partner, the kind of characteristics that that prophet in this particular case had. And so we see him for the first time uh, actually comes on the stage as far as scripture is concerned. And David calls him and asks him about building. You know, you know here I am, I'm living you know, in a palace of cedar. And the Lord is in a place of, you know, of, of, base, of tapestry, basically. And, of course, Nathan, in that experience, who has been guiding David through his campaigns, of course, we know that. He's been guiding him. You know, says, hey, I mean, he listens to what David says. It sounds virtuous. It sounds right. But he tells him, go ahead and do, you know, what's on your heart. But that night, the scripture says there in Second, uh, second uh, Samuel chapter 7, the Lord comes to Nathan and tells him, no, that David is not to do that. And of course, we see the parallel scripture for that in 2 Samuel, is also in 1 Chronicles chapter 17. And he gives him, he lays out why he doesn't want David to do that. So that is the, you know, one of the few times that uh, even the prophet is drawn back. And of course, in that experience, we're all uh, shed it with the kind of insight that we need on the, whatever the circumstance is to continue to go before the Lord, particularly if it's something out of our lane. Now, when David was anointed to be king, David was anointed to be a warrior. So in his campaigns, as he was going forth, the Lord was with him. But building a palace, excuse me, but building a temple, not a palace, but building a temple to the Lord was, quote, out of David's lane. That's something that he clearly should have sought God about, fasted about, he and the prophet. But nevertheless, they were corrected in that regard, and David would not do that, but his son would. But the point that I want to get to now is that there is a point in David's life, and we see that in, first, in 2 Samuel chapter 11. It's well known, well chronicled here in scripture. And uh, it's the point in time when kings are going to war. That's what keeps them busy, keeps their minds busy, and he does not go. 
and uh, walking on his, within his palace, uh, at a height point, he can see this female. Now watch this, he has one of his, one of his servants go and see who that woman is, all right? And then he re responds and tells him it's the wife of Uriah the Hittite, as you know. Now at this point, he never calls for Nathan, and believe you me, Nathan has been involved in all of his decision making. Anything of a critical nature, he's been calling on Nathan. And this is so key that accountability partners can only help to a degree. They can only help. That's the reason why we say it is both Nathan, as we look at the imagery of the church, and it is also, you know, as we look at the imagery of the church, Nathan and the prophets, are, they are built into the design of the church and how the church are supposed to hold us all accountable. But nevertheless, we can see in that experience that David goes and has a relationship with Bathsheba. She brings forth child, and then plan A, plan B brings her husband home, one of the top 30 soldiers, Uriah, uh, does a number of things to try to get him to go lay with his wife. He is so loyal, he won't do that. This is the same David who has been so loyal to God and so loyal to his troops. Remember that experience where he sent some emissaries off to see uh, one, of the, uh, one of the kings of the land, Ammonites, Amorites, one of them. And when they get there, they think that they're spies. They cut their hair, their beards, and they cut them bald and cut their uh, clothes off and sends them back naked to David. David is ready, ready, so loyal to his people. So loyal to those men, he's ready, and he does. He goes in and conquers those folks who would do such a thing. This is how loyal David was. But now he has a man who's been loyal to him. And in his darkness and in his sin, he actually takes this man, has him placed strategically at a poor place where he would die. That is the orders that are given to Joab, and Joab carries out the orders. Now we're back to the accountability of Nathan. Nathan now hearing from God about this circumstance, confronts in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 11, David with a parable about a man who had one little, one little lamb, one little ewe, ewe, ewe lamb, as we love to say, and that some person who is rich takes his lamb and provides an extraordinary banquet for some kind of visitor. And David, in his outrage, can see the error in what this person has done in the parable. And then Nathan, the accountability person, has to tell him, point blank, you are the man. Now, not only that, but he repeats to David what he has done. So it's not only about saying what you should not do. He repeats to him what he should not do. Now, watch this. Before he does that, in the scripture, he reminds David of how good God has been how good God has been to David. He's done this, he's done this, he's done this, and if you had wanted more, he would have given you this. This is all coming from the accountability part. Okay, after David has committed this extraordinary error in his life, extraordinary sin, he comes to him and he tells him all of the things that God has done. You ever heard somebody say, well, you know, you never should say, you know, you know, I told you so. Well, this is certainly begging to differ. And in the life of Paul, I beg to differ. There are times when you have to tell people, I told you so. And in this case, God's word told you. Now, God doesn't come after sin and then remind you of all the good things he's done for you. These words to David that Nathan mentioned to him about what God has done for him are all of the words that came to David to stop him before he committed the sin. Because that's how the operation of the Holy Spirit is in our lives. Nevertheless, he repeats to him what he has done, how horrible it is, and he doesn't stop there. He tells him about the consequences of what he has done. This is what accountability partners do. Accountability. See, this, there's a reason why David didn't call. Why didn't David call up on Nathan? I'm considering doing this. You know, but he didn't do that. And now in the church today, we have that same kind of responsibility. Just as Nathan had, or whether somebody calls upon you to be an accountability partner. You want them to call upon you, not only when there are things of decisions in ministry, but you also want them to call upon those things that are going to be in their personal lives that they are considering doing that may well cause them doom. I'm looking at in the life of it's really interesting, thereafter, after David dies, it is
is in his son's life. Uh, he is going Adonijah. to remember he wants to become the king. Solomon is actually going to become the king. But uh, he's actually, you know, he wants to usurp the authority of becoming the king. And the scripture clearly says, but he didn't call Nathan. He didn't call him to come to the sacrifices. He didn't call him to come to the banquets or anything of that nature. Meaning, here's the guy who his dad depended on in this particular case. But he is not going to depend on. Meaning, you know that it's wrong when you're getting ready to do that. So it doesn't matter whether you've got an accountability partner or not. If you're not going to use your accountability partner, then it really is not going to go well. But today in the church, we have the responsibility to face each other, to encounter each other, particularly on those things that are wrong. And we're so pleased that God's word says, confess your faults to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous person availed. Accountability partner, you've seen what it is. The prophets demonstrated, and it's in the church. When, if we're really going to have somebody who we're going to be accountable to, make sure that you're sharing all of those things with them that they can really help you with. May the Lord bless and keep you.